The effectiveness of any army's action is assessed not by the number of enemy soldiers killed, rather by the achievement of the set goals. It is possible to defeat the enemy and seize a part of the territory, but it is also possible to lose a war as a result, or vice versa, to make a strategy for rest, regrouping and arrangement of defense, thus sacrificing the minor details for the sake of achieving a greater objective. Preservation of the state sovereignty of the country was the main priority in the summer of 2014, and the armed forces of Ukraine coped with that task. This is the 22nd documentary film about the ATO, the history of the war. We are closely following the anti-terrorist operation in the east of Ukraine. What role does Russia play in these actions? How are politics and economics connected? And how do events in the east of Ukraine directly affect the life of Europeans? On September 5, 2014, the Minsk Protocol was signed. At 6 p.m. in the east of Ukraine, the truce officially came into effect. According to the diplomatic agreements that were signed, the so-called line of demarcation was established and an official ban on offensive actions was introduced. Bad peace is better than a good war. Combining diplomatic and military assurances, Ukraine was able to hold back the Russian army's offensive, thus preventing the potential outbreak of the World War III. According to the Minsk agreements, in addition to the ceasefire, it was necessary to organize the exchange of prisoners of war and withdrawal from the territory of Ukraine of all illegally armed formations. In view of the fact that Russia denied its participation in the conflict, Ukraine insisted on control of the ceasefire by representatives of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. This curtailed the freedom of maneuvers of Kremlin strategists, forcing them to somehow mask their troops more thoroughly. But in reality, military actions cannot be stopped by command, especially if one of the enemy sides is not in favor of such a decision. Practicing the use of irregular units, which don't obey any directives of headquarters, the Russian leadership continued its local offensive actions. The unofficial status of these formations prevented the public from paying attention to the rules and conventions. So, two hours before the formal conclusion of the truce on September 5th, a Russian sabotage group organized an ambush. Having raised the Ukrainian national flag at the checkpoint, militants stopped and opened fire at the column of the Idar battalion. 19 Ukrainian soldiers were killed. Half an hour later, a detachment of the 18th unit arrived. They managed to destroy the enemy's tanks and armored personnel carrier heading in the direction of the town of Shastia. However, one APC was blown up while driving across a landmine, and the total number of soldiers that died and went missing in action increased to 41. Russian journalists filmed the burning vehicles, the facts of abuse of the bodies of the deceased fighters, interviewed the so-called militants and showed the interrogations of the dying soldiers. Ironically, genuine Russian Nazis from the sabotage group Rusich conducted these terrible war crimes. Focusing on the cruelty of Russian saboteurs, journalists had two aims – to intimidate the enemy and by diverting attention with bloody shots conceal the fact of the participation of Russian troops. But thanks to these videos, it was possible to establish that there were some soldiers who were taken into captivity without any injuries, but they simply died just as Mikhailos Lysenko as a result of merciless tortures. In the evening of the same day, a group of Ukrainian soldiers was ambushed. Probably these were fighters of the 80th unit. According to locals, militants opened fire, demanding them to lay down their weapons. Ukrainian officers asked militants not to shoot and gave assistance to previously wounded comrades. All for them were captured and later were killed. Their bodies were found only in June 2015. Despite the announced truce, the Russian leadership didn't abandon its plans to seize Donbass and the entire territory of Ukraine. Columns of tankers and military equipment crossed the border. While the intensity of fighting had somewhat decreased, no ceasefire had been established. In September, Mariupol came under fire. 
Several shells hit some local apartment buildings and three innocent residents were killed. According to the United Nations organization, by autumn of 2014, as a result of Russian aggression, about 3,000 Ukrainian citizens were killed. However, it should be mentioned that due to the fact that losses of local militants weren't listed anywhere, the actual number of deaths was several times higher. At the same time, the work with exchange of prisoners and hostages was conducted. The number of captured Ukrainians was about 1,200 people on September 8. During the first four days of truce, 648 of them were exchanged. It is also important to note that there should be a certain delicate approach in the exchange process. A soldier in captivity has his price and the mutual relations at this level to a certain degree resemble exchanges on a trade and market. Despite the agreement to exchange all for all, militant commanders sought to gain benefits from this situation by trading people and even the bodies of dead soldiers. There were incidents of forgery when militants proposed average civilians and even homeless people that were taken off the streets as if they were Ukrainian soldiers. fire was being observed in a very conditional manner. On September 9th, the militants blew up a bridge in Pavlopil, and a landmine explosion killed three border guards near the village of Nizhnebaranikivka. This village on the border was never occupied and was not under control of the Luhansk People's Republic for even one day. In short, it was a Russian subversive group that was responsible for the terrorist attacks. There were reports on the accumulation of Russian troops near Novozovsk and their advancement near Slavyanoserbsk. Taking advantage of the insufficient number of Ukrainian troops, the militants occupied Dokuchayevsk and Komsomolskia. The terrorists also used heavy armor in the attack of the Donetsk airport, but they retreated after losing three tanks and two armored personnel carriers. The militants did not give up their efforts to seize the Donetsk airport since the first Minsk truce, when shelling Ukrainian positions with artillery from the residential districts of Donetsk, they were literally hiding behind civilians, which complicated the battle against the invading forces, and while the fighting in other zones of the demarcation line occasionally subsided and then started again with renewed vigor, the battle for the terminals of the Prokofiev airport continued up until the winter of 2015. On September 11th, the security service of Ukraine detained a saboteur group in Mariupol, which was given the task to organize terrorist attacks in the city. Near Pervomaisk, the militants opened fire on a civilian bus. On the same day, they attacked a Ukrainian checkpoint near Mayorsk, but met fierce retaliation and were forced to retreat. On the night of September 12th, after another failed attempt to attack the Donetsk airport, the militants claimed that they had seized six units of aircraft. That information was absolutely false, as there was literally no such number of aircraft in working condition. That was an attempt to legitimize aviation support from the Russian Federation by using the allegedly planned scheme. As always, it's quite simple. A statement was made about gaining rich trophies, and the next day those allegedly repaired vehicles take part in combat, piloted by some apparently talented miners. However, the militants were late in making the statement, as the situation changed and it drowned in digital noise. As a result of this struggle at the diplomatic level and with the help of international pressure, around 60 Russian military aircraft were pulled out from the Russian-Ukrainian border. That is precisely what prevented the full-scale invasion, as Russia was forced to withdraw a significant number of its military troops from Ukraine. On September 13th, the positions of Ukrainian troops were attacked by approximately 200 soldiers under the Russian banner near Pantelimonivka. Despite the Minsk truce, the villages of Krynichne, Troitske, and Zhdanivka were shot with multiple launch rocket systems. Also on that day, the second so-called humanitarian convoy of 200 transport trucks entered the territory of Ukraine. 
the motorcade brought ammunition and fuel, and on the way back the white trucks took another portion of equipment from the local factories. The Russian army burned the harvest and destroyed the houses of locals with artillery strikes. That was the stick. The humanitarian aid that the convoy sent by Russian President Vladimir Putin was the carrot. At the same time, defense lines were being set up near Mariupol. The proximity to the front line put the civilians in danger. The strategic importance of the city with its metallurgical enterprises and the port were a valuable target for the enemy. Therefore, much greater attention was given to enhancing the defense of the city. Concrete tetrapods, which are usually used to build breakwaters and strengthen the shore, were used as anti-tank obstacles. Slabs of concrete also turned out to be perfect for reinforcing positions. Semi-finished metallurgy products, 15 cm thick rectangular metal plates, were used to withstand artillery shells, much to the surprise of the enemy soldiers. On September 16th, the so-called Joint Armed Forces of Novorossiya were created. Ivan Korsun was appointed the Commander-in-Chief, although, as it later turned out, that measure wasn't coordinated with the bosses in the Kremlin, so the new commander was arrested on suspicion of organizing a military coup just two days later. Meanwhile, the Verkhovna Rada adopted two important laws within the Minsk agreements. The first one, on the special self-government order of certain regions of Donbass, regulated the creation of local self-government bodies, the organization of elections, the appointment of local council members, and contrary to the claims of Russian propaganda, allowed the use of the Russian language. The second law on the prevention of persecution and punishment of participants of the events on the territory of Donetsk and Luhansk regions was basically an amnesty. People who did not commit serious crimes, looting or murder, were guaranteed that they would not be subject to criminal prosecution, despite their possible participation in separatist referendums and even squads of the so-called militia. People were offered a second chance and choice. It was also an important message. Ukraine remembers its citizens and tries to take care of them, regardless of language or place of residence. It is impossible to reverse history, but one must always look into the future. On the night of September 20th, in Minsk, an agreement was reached on a ceasefire, stopping on the actual demarcation line and creating a 30-kilometer security zone along it. Both sides pledged to withdraw all heavy weapons with a caliber of more than 100 millimeters. Flights of any aircraft except for those belonging to the OSCE were banned above that security zone. Ground-based monitoring of the disposal of weapons by means of foreign observers was introduced. Thanks to these efforts, the intensity of fighting decreased. Despite the agreements, a demarcation line was established, the configuration of which only depended on the capabilities of the sides involved. Although, being bent under the pressure of the Russian Federation, Ukraine persevered. <laughs> 